Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. In this week's Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we bring you President Trump's first Deputy National Security Advisor, Katie McFarland, for a discussion on her brand new book, Revolution, Trump, Washington, and We the People. For decades, Katie McFarland has been one of the country's most prominent conservative foreign policy experts. When she left the Trump administration in Washington, she disappeared from public view and refused to discuss her experiences. Now, for the first time, she tells her story and gives you a tour through this unique moment in history. Prior to her time in the White House, Katie McFarland was Fox News' national security analyst from 2010 to 2016. She also held national security posts in the Nixon, Ford, and Reagan administrations as an aide to Dr. Henry Kissinger, member of the Senate Armed Services Committee staff, senior speechwriter to Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger, and later Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense and Pentagon spokesman. Among other accomplishments, she drafted the Weinberger Doctrine speech regarding the Reagan administration's policy on use of force and the first draft of President Reagan's Star Wars speech. In 1985, Ms. McFarland received the Defense Department's highest civilian honor, the Distinguished Service Award, for her work in the Reagan administration. We now invite you to enjoy our virtual program Coming to you from our Air Force One Pavilion Leadership Academy Oval Office with KT McFarland and Reagan Foundation and Institute Executive Director John Highbush. KT McFarland, just an absolute pleasure to have you virtually with us uh, today. We certainly wish that we had you in person, but as you know, because of this virus, that's not uh, possible right now. Just know you are invited out here anytime. When we get that vaccine, we'd love to have you at the Reagan Library for an event and to talk about your book then as well. Don't you worry. I'll be there the minute I can. And I want to sit right next to you in the Oval Office and tell you where everybody in the Reagan administration used to sit along this office. Yeah, terrific, terrific. Um, what a great book. And of course, having you know, working here at the Reagan Library and supporting President Reagan's legacy it was a, just a ton of fun to read um, parts throughout your book about your experience, in, of course, in several presidential administrations, but in President Reagan's for sure. And I think I recall you described yourself as a foot soldier in the Reagan Revolution. I, I know you were much more than that, but can you talk, what were the roles that you played in the Reagan administration, and and just for a moment, tell us about that time. Well, I'd already worked, as you point out, I'd already been in government before in the Nixon Ford administration. I uh, had an office right down the hall from where you're sitting right now. I worked for Henry Kissinger as his, for about seven years, um, starting as a college intern all the way up to um, his research assistant. And I was going to graduate school during the Carter administration. And then when President Reagan swept into office against all anticipated calculations by all the you know, Illuminati, um, I then left um, MIT where I was and I came to Washington, worked first for John Tower on the Senate Armed Services Committee. And then um, in the first year of the Reagan administration, moved over to the Pentagon where I was Cap Weinberger's speechwriter and special assistant. And in that role, I was, um, my job, I mean, the way Cap Weinberger explained it to me, my job was to take the Reagan revolution, peace through strength, really, and to turn it into language um, that the American people could understand and really help to promote the whole Reagan defense program, which no one understood at the time was, in fact, very revolutionary. And within, what, a little bit more than a decade, 
He won the Cold War without firing a shot and did it on our terms. So yeah, it was a pretty exciting and heady time to be a foot soldier in the Reagan revolution. Fascinating to read that because of uh, your position in the role of speechwriter, which often has to assemble the views of many and, of course, uh, put them in the Secretary of Defense's words and eventually the president's, is that you uh, played a very key role in some of the first draft of the what became known as Star Wars, but the famous Reagan speech on SDI. Can you tell us about that experience, pulling that together? Well, um, early on, in the very, really before he even became president, President Reagan looked at the concept of what we called mutually assured destruction. And the way we kept the peace in the nuclear era and the way we had kept it for decades was that the United States and the Soviet Union basically had a gun in each other's heads. And it was called mutually assured destruction. So if the Russians started a nuclear war, we would have enough nuclear weapons after they had attacked us to attack them with the same amount of devastation. So that was a war that no one could win. Um, and, and President Reagan understood that. And, and the way we kept the peace was, you know, again, guns at each other's heads. And President Reagan was always uncomfortable with that. He said, why, you know, this is a pretty lousy way to keep the peace. Glad it's keeping the peace, but is there another way? So um, President Reagan, in quest of winning the Cold War, rebuilt America's defenses, which had been had lagged behind greatly during the 1970s, at the same time the Soviet Union had built up their defenses greatly. So President Reagan, first of all, wanted to rebuild American defenses, and he had achieved that within the first year or two of the administration. But in the back of his mind, it was always, gee, is there some other better way that we can keep the peace? And at that time, the def so we had offensive nuclear weapons, but no defense. I mean, what people, I think the American people didn't realize that, well, if the Russians decide they're going to attack, um, we may be able to attack back. But a lot of Americans are going to die in the process. So President Reagan always wanted to figure out, is there a way to have a defense against incoming Soviet nuclear armed missiles? And that was a strategic defense initiative. Now, the reason that we had been unable to do that, the United States prior to that, was where the technology just wasn't there. So President Reagan, when he came in, he said, well, let's revisit the technology. What's changed? in the last decade since the United States had taken a look at it. And there had been a number of things that had changed. We developed computers, miniaturization. We could have laser beams. The technology of the computer internet um, generation had just started. And so he looked at that and said, well, maybe I'm gonna offer hope to the American people. I'm gonna set the United States on a course that we can put a nuclear umbrella, a defensive umbrella over the United States and our allies. And in fact, if we get a defense system that works against nuclear weapons, we would even share it with everybody. Because if everybody's safe from nuclear weapons, then the world is a much safer place. So President Reagan, of course, understood that the bureaucracy, same arguments we're having today, I might point out, that the bureaucracy would be up in arms against this, that they would object to it, that there would be a whole lot of vested interest to say, no, 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 we need offensive nuclear weapons, et cetera, et cetera. And so President Reagan understood that if he was going to spring it on the, on the country, on the, on the world, he would have to do it really in his own words, in his own time, with his own small circle of people having looked at it. Otherwise, it would leak. And in Washington, then a lot of bureaucrats and others would just sort of undermine it. So that's why President Reagan had selected, um, he had selected a speech that he was intending to give on defense spending and on the Reagan defense buildup to really keep the, the, keep the um, American people in line and on course to, for the Reagan defense buildup. But he was gonna insert a special paragraph in that no one would see in advance, just a handful of people. And he was going to tell the American people that the technology had gotten to the point where we could now contemplate that we could put resources into developing a defensive missile system that could defend the United States, our allies in the world from the Holocaust of nuclear weapons. So I was asked to draft that original speech to make the case for the Reagan defense buildup, and I did. But then Cap Weinberger, who was Secretary of Defense, he called me into his office after I'd written the speech, I sent it to the White House for them to vet. And he said, now, you can't tell anybody, really, because only a handful of people know, but the president 
has an announcement he wants to make in the middle of that speech. And since we want you to be the point person, you'll go to meetings at the NSC and in the White House and, and keep me, the Secretary of Defense, informed of how this is going. So I did. And President Reagan then put in his own words, in his own hand, he wrote the um, very inspirational, really the, the, the dream of the American people to build a missile defense system using new technologies. And so the night of the speech, he was sitting right behind you in the Oval Office. The cameras were right about where you're sitting now. And they were focused on President Reagan. And I was invited to come and sit in the office right behind the door where you're sitting now and be with the president as he gave that speech because I'd written the original draft. And anyway, it was his way of, of you know, giving me acknowledgement. After he gave the speech, he walked out of the Oval Office and went into the um, East Room of the White House. And there assembled were a series of scientists and military experts and Air Force and other, but it was maybe only 30 or 40 people, but real scientists um, who knew about the different technologies, laser technology, miniaturization, computerization. And he came to the, to the, um, to the White House and said to everybody assembled, now I've just given the American people a challenge and it's going to be up to you, the people in this room to figure out how to do it. Well, everyone shook their hands and they left and the president left, but I stuck around and I listened to some of the scientists. I think Edward Teller was there, Nobel or various people. And they all started talking amongst themselves. And, you know, maybe it's possible. What if we do this? What if we do that? And that was the beginning of the Star Wars um, initiative. Now, the very next day, the New York Post, which is famous for its catchy headlines, um, it dubbed it not Strategic Defense Initiative, which is what we were calling it, but they dubbed it Star Wars Plan to zap red nukes. And the reason was Star Wars, the original Star Wars movie, was the most popular movie at the time. And so this was envisioning President Reagan was going to have a Star Wars plan to get rid of Russian nukes. And the name Star Wars was far more attractive and stuck. But again, I think that the, the thing to remember about it, if I can ramble on, is how revolutionary that idea was. Because at the time, Republicans, Democrats, Europeans, communists, everybody around the world thought the only way you could keep the peace between two nuclear superpowers was this Mexican standoff of mutually assured destruction. So when President Reagan announced that maybe we'll go in a different direction, not because we want to keep it to ourselves so that we can defend ourselves, but the Soviet Union can't be defended, he would share it. And that was just a revolutionary concept. We're still having the same debate today, but I credit President Reagan for the, the guts and the courage to having that revolutionary idea and then throwing it out, even though he knew it would not happen probably in his lifetime, but that it might happen someday. I knew you would have a great story about that, Katie. So thank you so much for bringing us into the room. That, that's really special. Um, you were also involved in, uh, as a speechwriter, I think, um, in another very critical speech of Cap Weinberger's that became administration, Reagan administration policy, and, and still to this day, uh, um, I think, stands as a critically important way for the United States to look at use of force, you know, when to use military force. Can you talk to us about that, uh, that speech and that moment in time as well? Well, I should preface it by saying that Secretary of Defense Weinberger and President Reagan, they were not just new friends. They had, their friendship had gone back decades. And they had shared ideas about everything from economics to tax policy to political strategy to military strategy for decades. So President um, Reagan had always said you know, the, and he would use it, I think he called it the Jack Dempsey rule, that the United States doesn't pick fights. We don't start wars. We finish them. But we want to have the strongest military in the world, not because we intend to use it to conquer countries or to subjugate others, but to prevent them from attacking us. And that is a very different concept than many people had or still have about the use of military force. So the whole point of the Reagan defense buildup was not because we wanted to go to war with the Soviet Union. We wanted to prevent a war with the Soviet Union. 
It was a defensive strategy. President Reagan had also seen, you know, the United States during the 1970s, not unlike today, had gone through an, a wrenching war in Vietnam, um, which we ended up losing for a lot of reasons. But it was something that really soured the American people um, to a certain extent on use of force overseas. So when President Reagan came in in 1980, inaugurated in 1981, the, U, the U.S. military and the United States had what was called the Vietnam Syndrome, that we had had such a searing experience in Vietnam that we were, we knew we needed a strong defense, but we were kind of afraid of how would we use it? You know, what, were, what is this military going to be for? And President Reagan made it clear to Kath Weinberger, our military is to deter conflict, not to start conflict. But it, and we hopefully, Nobody attacks us because like Jack Dempsey, the prize fighter, who was the strongest, best prize fighter in the history of the world, nobody's gonna pick a fight with him because they're always gonna lose. But if another country decided to pick a fight with us, we would always be able to prevail because our military was the strongest. So Cap Weinberger um, wanted to articulate this into a speech because there were other forces in the Reagan administration who, um, who did want to use American military force overseas uh, to kind of exploit our military advantage that we were building up with the Reagan administration. And so Weinberger wanted to be on the record to say, we don't go attack others. We don't start preemptive wars. We don't conquer nations. We, we want to defend and we will defend ourselves and our allies, but we're not picking fights with anybody. And so President Reagan and Cap Weinberg talked about it at great length. It was at the end of Reagan's first term. And Cap Weinberg, Cap Weinberger came back from an Oval Office meeting and he said to me, well, I've talked to the president. We want to go ahead and I'm going to make the speech about the principles of use of force. And you start drafting it, but we're not going to probably have me give it until after President Reagan is reelected because it's a political issue as well. So then I set out to interview all of the senior officials um, in the military, you know, all, the, all of the services, as well as some of the senior thinkers. Um, I did a lot of research, a lot of reading, talked to a lot of experts. When does America use force? And it's probably one of the most critical questions that we have. We're still debating it today, you know, after Iraq and Afghanistan. So we came up, the, the principles that I came up with, and obviously working hand in hand with President, with um, Secretary Weinberger, where the whole concept of you don't get into, a, you don't start a war. And if you, have to, if you have to go to war, you go to win. You have adequate resources. You have a strategy that allows you to win. You know that you have the full support of the American people behind you because what we learned in Vietnam is that the people will change. And then there you are with a war that you can't win because public support isn't there, but you can't really lose because you've staked yourself on it. So these were, then we articulated a series of principles. They were called the Weinberger principles. And Weinberger and Reagan talked back and forth about it. And, and that became the foundation of the Weinberger Doctrine, which President Reagan fully embraced. And it was, a, it was, meant, not, it was meant as guidelines, not a surefire test, you know, check, check, check. But it was meant to be, um, it was meant to refrain from the United States taking preemptive action against adversaries. It was meant to encourage diplomacy. It was meant to adequately resource fights if we had them. And whatever we did, if we ever found ourselves in a situation that we went to war, we would win. We would go to war to win. The way President Reagan used that in his own go to war situation was in Grenada, where communist forces had taken over a small island in the Caribbean, had overthrown an elected um, leader, and were trying to establish a communist dictatorship in the island of Grenada. So we went to war not because we started the war. We wanted to just bring the democratic government back. And when President Reagan was sitting right behind that desk and Cap Weinberger was briefing him along with the, the military chiefs, he was presented with several options of how to do it. And, one, and Cap Weinberger said, well, this is what we need to make sure we prevail in Grenada. It'll be a short, fast war, adequately resourced. And then President Reagan and his genius said, well, whatever you think you need, double it. Because if Jimmy Carter had had adequate resources going into Iran to rescue American diplomats held hostage in Tehran, if he had gotten them out successfully, I wouldn't be sitting here. So President Reagan understood the concept of that you had to adequately, in fact, over adequately, um, prepare yourself for combat. Now, 
when the um, after step, so those were the rules that were really governing at least the Reagan administration on the use of force. Some criticize it as, as being too defensive, that, that it would hamstring the United States. We could never use our military forces if we needed to. Others said, well, you know, this is a prudent list of things we need to consider if we are going to, for, to war. What happened after September 11th was that the people, some of the same people who had been in the Reagan administration were now in the Bush, George W. Bush administration. And they said that, well, those Weinberger doctrines, the, the Reagan doctrine, we'll just push that aside. And we are now going to be, we're going to now advocate offensive um, preemptive war. And that's what the Iraq war was, is that we would go in, America would start the fight um, because we thought there were weapons of mass destruction. Well, I think we can now look back and say, you know, if they had looked at President Reagan's policy, if they had looked at Cap Weinberger's principles of war, the things that would guide us when we use force abroad. Maybe we wouldn't have had a war that we ended up losing with tragic consequence. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Great, great history lesson there, KT. Um, you have a, and let, let me use that to transition to another modern day president, um, uh, President Trump. You have a uh, quote in your book. I, I pulled it out. I want you to You'll remember it. Um, and you say, the irony is every Republican presidential candidate for decades has declared himself to be a Reagan Republican. Yet the only one who hasn't claimed Reagan's mantle is probably the one who comes close to having the right to wear it. Explain that. Well, when President, um, then candidate Trump, uh, was creating his foreign policy. He said, I believe in peace through strength. And I want to make America great again. I want, I want to have a military buildup, just like Reagan. So I was asked, he had asked me to brief him on foreign policy issues. So when he, when I came in during the campaign and I gave him a briefing, I said, you know, it's so great that you've adapt, adopted President Reagan's peace through strength. And he looked at me like, huh? <laughs> As if he had never heard of President Reagan. And, and in any event, it was going to be his own policy, but it was a very similar policy because President Reagan chose those words very carefully. You know, it sounds like it's a throwaway line, right? Peace through strength. Who's against peace? You know, who doesn't want to be strong? But President Reagan chose those three words extremely carefully because peace, he didn't mean the peace of conquest or the peace of capitulation. And he didn't mean strength, military strength alone. He meant economic strength, the strength of the strength of our democratic system, the strength of our innovation and technology, the strength of who we are as the American people. And that's how we would keep the peace. So when President Reagan came in, he, again, he really upended American foreign policy and national security policy. And when President Trump came in, he really did the same. He didn't think through it in the same way that Reagan did. And he clearly is very different from President Reagan in temperament and personality and a whole lot of other reasons. But oddly enough, all the Republicans have always said, I'm the Reagan Republican. You know, it's me. I'm just like Ronald Reagan. Whether it's Rand Paul on one end, who's an anti-intervention, he's an anti-interventionist, or whether it's the neoconservatives who are believed very much in preemptive war. They all say, well, I'm the real Reagan Republican here. And the joke of it is that Donald Trump because he adopted peace through strength, because he wanted the military and defense buildup, because he didn't believe in going to fighting in foreign wars that we couldn't win, where we would get nothing from it. He didn't believe in sort of wasting American blood and treasure. He actually was closest to Reagan, even though he was the one guy who wasn't busy claiming Reagan's mantle for himself. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was fun to read. Uh, you took us in the room. I, um, and made the point, um, you're the one that sat down and said, hey, you know, great slogan, make America great again, Mr. Trump, uh, President Trump. Uh, that We had a great time using that during President Reagan's years. And, and I think it was probably the first time he'd heard that, apparently, right? It was a, it well, was a I don't know. Slogan. I mean, no, because he understood yeah. the importance of it. And he must have heard it somewhere before because he went and copyrighted it or patented it or whatever you do yes, to yeah. get that phrase. Right. And so... Did he remember that it was actually Reagan's campaign theme, that his defense policy was really peace through strength, that Reagan's policy was make America great again? Whether Donald Trump knew it or not, he fell into the same pattern. And I think a lot of it, though, 
is not deliberate as much as circumstantial. You know, the United States in 1980 was very much in the same position as the United States in 2016. The economy didn't work. We had come off of a decade of failed foreign wars. We had let our military atrophy. Um, our, we had high unemployment and we had sort of no cure in sight. And, and America in 2016 was really, the establishment leaders were all about kind of managing the decline, Republicans and Democrats. And that was the same thing it was in 1980. And Reagan and Trump both understood that you, the way America thrives and, and is such a strong and great nation is that you just take the, the, you know, the shackles that government puts on our industry, our innovation, our small business, just get the shackles off and let Americans do their thing. And so, yes, I do think that Ronald Reagan set the, set the crown that everybody else has tried to wear, but Donald Trump in his own inimitable way um, really adapted, adopted all of President Reagan's policies with great success. Yeah. You know, it was fascinating to see in your book, KT, that you, you don't pull punches with respect to if you've got criticisms or, you know, concerns about uh, how President Trump might say things or do things. Um, you lay it out as, as well as you do uh, what you see are his, his, you know, remarkable strengths. Um, and in doing so, you make a point um, that I think is really telling with respect to how people should think of, of President Trump. And you, you really stress, listen, if you want to understand President Trump, watch what he does, not what he says. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the reasons we love Ronald Reagan is because, and if you go back, and I'm sure you do all the time, I mean, you're working there at the Reagan Library, you, you look at the things he said and the way he sort of spoke to the soul of America, it's inspirational. I mean, it just makes, brings tears to my eyes sometimes when I see old video clips of President Reagan, you know, the Statue of Liberty, or when he's talking about immigration. Now, Donald Trump is a very, very, very different guy. But what I have learned in working for him is always look at what he does, never what he says, because he says a lot of stuff. He's not, a, he's not an eloquent speaker, clearly, like President Reagan is. But he, he says, you know, on one hand, Kim Jong-un, the dictator of North Korea, he says, my rockets are bigger than your rockets. And then on the other hand, a couple of weeks later, oh, we're sending love letters to each other. President Reagan, the way um, President Reagan understood things was he, he really felt that his job was to be the moral leader of America. I don't think Donald Trump sees things that way. Don, for Donald Trump and, and the generation that he grew up in, it was all about winning. And he comes from the business world. And in the business world, you know, every night you, you can look at your you know, profits and losses. You either made money that day or you didn't. When you sold a building, you either made money on it or you lost money. And then Trump entered the um, Hollywood era. I mean, the television reality TV created reality television. And in television, I can tell you, having worked for almost a decade at Fox News, you look at your ratings. You know, did you get good ratings that day or did you get bad ratings that day? You can have a constant measurement and metric by which you judge yourself. In politics, I guess the only judgment you have is every four years, there's an election for president. So there's, so words matter a lot in Washington. And sometimes deeds kind of get sort of pushed along the side because people promise everything, do very little. The thing about Donald Trump is if you look at what he's done, he's been Reagan. He's cut taxes. He's streamlined regulation. He's gotten us off of Middle East oil by having the United States become energy independent. He hasn't gotten us in foreign wars. He stood up to China. And yet, does he talk? I think, I think the biggest mistake he makes is he doesn't talk about his achievements. He gets sort of sidetracked and fighting with people. But the achievements are quite significant. So for me, you know, I, I'm a fair judge of Donald Trump. And I come down on the side of what he has done is reverse the decline, the inevitable decline that the United States was heading for. And he's given us a new breath, a new opportunity. Now, the pandemic has changed things, obviously. But President Trump, he rebuilt the American economy once. He'll do it again. And I don't think that, um, I'm not as focused on what he says. I don't get outraged like some people do. I guess I've been around enough to not worry about the outrage. But I look at the deeds, not as much the words. The words can come later. I hope they do. Because either Donald Trump or whoever carries up the mantle that he's 
um, that he's been promoting, the, really the Reagan mantle, will find the words and bring us back together as a nation. Yeah, well said. You, uh, you go into at some length about President Trump's tweets, which ties into just what you were talking about there. I get a question that I, uh, I think is kind of interesting, and I'll throw it at you, and that is, if President Reagan, if the technology were there during the Reagan administration and he could have tweeted, would he? Would Reagan have tweeted, do you think? Sure. I'm not sure he would have tweeted like Donald Trump does. He wouldn't have picked the fights. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have done that. But President Reagan, I mean, I think all, all transformative presidents, whether it's George Washington, whether it's um, Abraham Lincoln, or even going before that, Andrew Jackson, Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, Reagan especially, and Trump, they've all understood that the technology of communicating with people had changed, um, and, and they capitalized on it. They all found a way to go directly to the American people, really over the heads of the high priests and mandarins of the media. And they found a way to directly connect. I mean, that was one of the things we thought about a lot in the Reagan administration, is how do you talk directly to the American people? Um, you can give a speech, you can have a press conference, but how do you talk directly to the American people? And President Reagan understood the value of television. That was the, um, he grew up in the era of television, professionally grew up in the era of television. And so he understood the value of the, of the picture as well as the word. President Trump understood, okay, the technology has changed again. There's television, there's the spoken word, but there's also social media. And the advantage that Trump saw that, I mean, by the time 2016 came around, there were plenty of social media. I mean, every politician had a Facebook page and a Twitter account, but it was bland and it was boring. And it sounded like it had been written by robots. But President Trump, candidate Trump, understood you have to break through the noise with kind of outrageous, you know, over the top sometimes. You had to capture the American people's um, attention span with the tweets. And so I think that that's how he used it. President Reagan understood you captured the American attention span with that image, with the visual, so that you had the visual and the words together as well as the policies. So would Ronald Reagan have tweeted? You bet! He would have had a Facebook page. He would have been tweeting. I think he would have tweeted very different things, though, however. I don't think he would have done the divisive stuff. I think he would have used social media um, to how should we say it too? Well, I guess what did Reagan say? That one of his greatest accomplishments was to give the people of the United States a new sense of, of love of their country and a new sense of patriotism. I think he would have used it that way. Yeah, yeah, great. Well said. Um, I, and I think I just heard you say it, but it's, I'll ask the question anyways. Um, everyone looks at certain presidents as being transformational. Ronald Reagan fits right in that set. I remember uh, early in the Obama presidency, the media saw him carrying uh, one of President Reagan's books um, with the idea of thinking about how he too could be a transformative president. Is Donald Trump going to be looked upon as being a transformational president? I think a lot will depend on whether he wins a second term. But he has set out to be a transformational president in the following way, very similar to Reagan. The United States, um, you know, in the Reagan administration, the United States had a competitor, and that was the Soviet Union and communism. The United States has a competitor now, and that is China, also Chinese communism, authoritarianism. So there's the, the international challenge, and then there's the domestic challenge at home. And, you know, I think that what happens in the United States, what happens in every country, is that government, elected government, whether it's a democracy or even if it's an aristocracy inherited government, government by its very nature is status quo. It sort of digs in. They want to perpetuate their rights. They want to perpetuate their privileges. They come to think of government as themselves, not the people. Even in a democracy, government, Washington establishment, comes to think of, well, we know better. We know better than the American people. Um, we're going to govern. And if they make a mistake every now and then elect the wrong guy, it's okay, we're going to be in charge here. And so I think that's what President Reagan understood and that President Trump understands, that it is we the people and that we are meant to have transformational president. We are meant to have political revolutions. The first revolution we had was obviously in 1776, and that was an armed revolution. But it, it was accomplishing the same thing. It was to throw off the establishment ruling class, which wasn't 
getting the job done for the American people, for the colonial, you know, the colonial Americans at that point. And then we had another political revolution with Andrew Jackson in the 1830s. Again, because the government in Washington, who had been the heir, the, you know, the sons and the grandsons of our original founding fathers, well, they weren't connecting to the American people anymore. And so we had another political revolution. We had a political revolution during the Civil War. We had one during the progressive movement and the, um, in the Industrial Revolution with, uh, with Teddy Roosevelt. And then we had one with the Great Depression with Franklin Roosevelt and also then with Reagan, obviously, and now with Trump. And I think the reason, I mean, this is sort of the philosophy that I came to, the conclusion I came to, because nobody likes what we're going through now. It's nasty. And Washington's only getting nastier. But what happens in government is that it becomes so protective of its own rights that it sort of digs in. And yet the American people, by our very nature, we're innovate, we're constantly changing American society. And it's not just immigration. We're changing demographically, geographically. Um, our culture is changing. Um, the innovation society is changing. So our government is right here. And that the people of the United States are changing. So after about 40 years, Years, the people say, wait, you're not getting the job done anymore, guys. We're going to just throw you all out. And that's the transformational precedent. And the transformational precedent shakes up the political coalitions. Reagan did. Trump is certainly doing that today. The transformational precedent takes advantage of the media of the moment to communicate with the American people. And every transformational precedent has been a grassroots, has come from the bottom up. It hasn't come from the top down. And that, I think, is, in fact, the essence of American exceptionalism. Other countries, you know, they may have a change of, of administration here or there, and they may tweak it around. But the United States, we rise, we shine, and then we decline a little bit, and then we rise again. And we rise again because of these transformative presidents who are not just there. I mean, they're not there by accident. They're there because the American people have demanded a change. So do I think Trump is transformational? You bet. And I think that there is a civil war in the Republican Party. Um, Trump won it in 2016. I think there is a civil war with the Democrats right now. Are they traditional Democrats or are they progressive, you know, socialist Democrats? And we are going through a period of enormous um, social and, and transformational change. And so, yes, I do think Donald Trump is the transformational president. Well, one area where no doubt, and your book points this out, he's absolutely been transformative, um, is in the energy sector because, uh, I don't know, five, ten years ago, in a million years, people wouldn't have expected the United States would actually be able to achieve energy independence as it has. And uh, so I wanted to ask you, KT, um, one of the points you make in the book is that because we've been able to become energy independent, uh, we have um, essentially achieved a, a strategic advantage from a foreign policy standpoint in that we don't need to get mired down in the Middle East because of our energy concerns. I wonder if Trump were not to win in this, this November, or would you be concerned, here we go, right back into having to focus on the Middle East again because we'll lose our energy independence? I think that, but also the, even the bigger picture would be China. So... I mean, what what was driving American foreign policy really, uh, I don't know, since probably FDR, but certainly since the early 1970s, was the need for energy from the Middle East. And so we were stuck. We had to get pulled in, drawn into their, you know, tribal, ethnic, sectarian, psychodramas for decades. And we, we got pulled into the middle of their civil wars, which we don't want to, you never want to be in the middle of a civil war in the Middle East because both sides lose. So what Trump understood was if America be, can be energy independent, we had the ability to do it with horizontal drilling, with, well, with fracking. He understood if we could be energy independent, it would be kind of a triple win. First of all, it would get us no longer dependent on the psychodramas of the Middle East. Number two, it would be a terrific economic boost for the United States because it would make not only the energy industry in the US, but it would mean American manufacturing would be far more competitive than manufacturing in countries which had to import their energy. And the final thing is, you know, for an, from an environmental perspective, fracking, natural gas is a whole lot better than dirty coal. So it was a, it was a win environmentally too, although Trump will never get credit for it. But by promoting American energy independence, we have done what we should have done 20 years ago, which was we were able to take our focus off of the Middle East and put it where it belonged, which was China and Asia. 
Now, I worry that if President Trump is not reelected, two things happen. Well, three things. One, the economy will just spiral downward because it'll be tax and spend Democrats to the point where the United States may economically never recover. The second thing is, though, I do think we get sucked into the Middle East and worrying about energy, um, our, our sources of energy. But finally, and probably most importantly, you know, the Chinese had a plan that the Chinese had planned to supplant the United States as the dominant world power by mid-century, and that they could then rewrite the rules of international order. The pandemic has speeded up their timeline. They plan within the next three or four or five years to emerge from this period as the dominant economy, as the dominant military power. And their hope is that the United States becomes a declining power to the point where it never recovers. And so that's why I think that everybody says this election is the most important. But um, for Donald Trump, all of his divisiveness, he understands that the real point here is can we stand up to the Chinese? Because they've got a really, you know, this is a country, these are man with a plan because they plan to dominate the uh, maritime trade route through the South China Sea. They've already claimed it as an internal Chinese lake. They plan to dominate the land-based trade route from the One Belt, One Road policy where they're building highways to link Europe and the Middle East um, and South Asia and Southeast Asia to China that they would dominate. They plan to dominate the communications infrastructure of the world with a 5G um, Huawei plan. And they, they plan to dominate you know, international organizations. So their plan, and they're well along on that route, is to be the dominant economic power, which then allows them to translate that economic power into political, military, and diplomatic power. And I don't think a President Joe Biden and his team are going to stand up to China in the way that Trump has stood up to China. And that, I think, is the end. And I don't think we ever recover after that, because once China is the dominant world power, then it will do everything in its power to make sure that the United States no longer represents any kind of a competitor to it. Yeah, yeah this, this one's for all the marbles, right? And this is... Yeah, this is it. it, it this really we don't have this. this uh, you don't have time to. This, this does. You don't get a mulligan. You don't get a redo on this. We either yeah. use American economic and innovative power now to stand up to the Chinese. Not that we want to contain them or we want to defeat them. We certainly don't want to go to war with them. But that we don't want them to do what the Soviet Union planned to do to the United States and the Reagan administration. We don't want China to write the rules of order because just look at what they've done in Hong Kong, what they do to their own people. You know, do you think that the American um, journalists and the media, American media is going to be able to have their own opinion in China? Do you think American foreign policy is going to be able to, to stand up against China if they are the dominant world power? Just look at how they behaved. You don't have to project much. You just look at their behavior so far. I want to come back to China in just a minute. Um, uh, you, you definitely just go into this in your book. But let, let me, we'll start a you know, little smaller theater, albeit um, incredibly important theater. And it's uh, in the order of um, your time in the Trump administration. It seems the very first uh, fundamental critical issue for the Trump uh, administration on the foreign policy front that was just literally put right in our lap was the North Korea situation, right? And I'd and, and I, I have to ask, you were right there on the inside. Um, does President Trump get the amount and kind of credit he deserves for pulling us back from the brink on, with North Korea? Can you just, in an unclassified way, try to get us to the inside as to just how incredibly scary that situation was with North Korea? First of all, Donald Trump will never get credit for for anything he does from the Washington establishment or the anti-Trump media. But what happened was that once President, um, once Trump was elected, he went to the Oval Office after the election and got briefed by President Obama, who was probably not very happy to see him and didn't expect to see him. But what Obama said was, look, the big problem, the first crisis you're going to have is on North Korea. So I had looked at, and I you know, followed North Korea for years, especially in Asia, its relationship with China and its nuclear program. And I was worried um, as was Vice President Pence and most of us, that, that the North Koreans always like to provoke a crisis on an American holiday when everybody, they, they love to do stuff in, in 
around Easter. They love to do stuff around Christmas. They love to do stuff around the 4th of July and inaugurations would be a bonanza for them. So I was concerned that they would have a, they would provoke a crisis on inauguration day. So um, I was worried that they could do one of two things. They would test a nuclear weapon, a uh, more sophisticated nuclear weapon than they had ever tested before. It would have been a big jump. Or I was worried that they would test a missile, a rocket system that would be capable of reaching the United States. Both of those would have been complete game changers for the North Koreans. So the first thing I did, and the first thing President Trump asked me to do was look at North Korea. So I, I convened some meetings in the White House Situation Room. I was the Deputy National Security Advisor, and that was my job. And so I had all the different agencies sitting around and the Situation Room looks exactly like it does in television. You know, they, there's a big long table, there are low ceilings, no windows. And so I went around and I asked the Treasury Department guy and the State Department guy and the Pentagon guy and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, well, you know, what, what do you have? You know, what's our current policy? What are your ideas? And I had no new ideas. And it was reflective of the Obama administration. The Obama policy towards North Korea was one of strategic patience, which basically means doing nothing, kicking the can down the road. And so I said, this was one week into the Trump administration, I said to the people around the table, I said, well, you know, you could have said the same thing two years ago in the Obama administration. And I looked around and I thought, actually, since the Trump administration doesn't have its senior officials in place yet, you probably are the same people who were saying, I'm probably the only new person at this table. And so I said, but I want you to all go back to your agencies and to think outside the box. We're gonna revisit North Korea's policy. And I want, and nothing is off the table. So revisit it in this way. At one hand, look at maybe recognizing North Korea as a nuclear weapons state. Maybe on the other hand, um, for regime change. And then look at overt and covert operations, cyber activities. I'm sure stuff has changed in the last several years since the last time you took a look. And so President Trump, we, we presented him um, with very different carrots and sticks. Historically, it was always a carrot and a stick. The United States would sanction, do something against North Korea, and then North Korea would do bad stuff, but then they would agree to come to the negotiating table and then we would release the bad stuff. So around and around and around we went. But President Trump really, and I give him enormous credit for this, he understood that with Kim Jong-un, then any negotiation was always gonna be personal. Because Kim Jong-un, he doesn't care about his people. He doesn't have to be reelected. For him, it was all about keeping himself in power. And how would he best keep himself in power? And I think President Trump understood a couple of things and, and he never gets credit for it, but he should. And that number one, keep the pressure on. If they come to the negotiating table, don't let up on the pressure, keep the pressure on. If you haven't gotten anything, they've just come to the table. They haven't conceded anything. And then the second thing he understood was what Kim Jong-un craved and only Trump could give him was credibility on the world stage. I mean, you know, he's the third generation of his family to run North Korea. And how does he make his mark? He, he would make his mark by standing toe to toe with the president of the United States. Now, a lot of President Trump's critics said, well, if you meet with President, um, the North Korean dictator, you're going to give him a lot of credibility and stature. He, why should you give him up without getting anything in return? But I think President Trump understood, yeah, that's the whole point. You give him stature. You meet with him in Singapore. You meet with him in Hanoi. You you show him what his future for his own people could be like, and and you know and you give him his moment on the world stage where he craves. You can just see by the body language. Kim Jong Un loved being, you know, big guy, toe to toe with the president of the United States. But once you give that, you can pull it away in a minute, and that's what nobody else understood. That President Trump, I think, uniquely understood that by holding out that care, the one thing only Trump could give him, which is credibility and stature, President Trump could pull that right away. And then where would Kim Jong-un be? He'd still be in North Korea, the hermit kingdom with a bunch of you know, generals with oversized hats and his nuclear weapons to play with. So I think that but if you look at where North Korea could have been by now, we fully, we the intelligence community, we the United States, we the Obama administration, we the Trump administration, expected Kim Jong-un to at this point have a nuclear, have a missile capable of reaching the United States and, a, and capable of carrying a nuclear weapon. He has neither of those two things. And so have we solved the North Korea problem? No. Have we prevented a real crisis? You bet we have.
Yeah, so far it's worked, right? Uh, um, we haven't talked about North Korea in many months, so it's not to say things won't change, but so far it's worked. Um, so let's loop back to China. Um, you, I think, gave three or four geostrategic political reasons why this is a real threat. Can you focus for us on specifically China's military strength from the standpoint of you know, how concerned should we be uh, with the Chinese military threat? Maybe not today, but in the future. And I say that because, well, yeah, well, you know, you lived the Reagan administration and the you know, the President Reagan was able to stare down the Soviets. He ended the Cold War. But they seem to be like pikers compared to what is potentially a threat militarily with China, right? I mean, China really has their act together. So uh, is the threat not, it just seems to me it could be 10x the threat we faced with Russia if they really want to focus on military strength. Yeah, but, but I think that what's happened is that China is a very different country than the Soviet Union and Russia. And that's because China, for 5,000 years of history, it doesn't necessarily conquer as it subjugates. It doesn't want it doesn't want competitors clearly, and it doesn't want allies. It wants vassals. It wants people to do their bidding. So when I look at the Chinese threat, it's primarily initially economic. It's they have a larger population. If they have all of the Chinese people become middle class consumers, exporters, they're an economy that will dwarf every other economy in the world unless the United States teams up with our European. And, and Japanese and Korean allies to present a trading block that's different. But the Chinese are now taking that economic, newfound economic um, power, and they are translating it into military power. So the primary place they've done this is in the South China Sea. So the South China Sea is the, world, the, mar the world's largest maritime, most important maritime trade route, because it, all the stuff is coming, the energy from the Middle East, products from Europe, stuff from the East Coast of Africa, all goes through um, south of India and it goes through um, uh, through the South China Sea to Asia. So the South China Sea has historically been a free and open place to for anybody's vessels and anybody's militaries to go. It's considered just like the Pacific Ocean, just like the Atlantic Ocean. It's open to everybody. What the Chinese have done is about eight years or eight years ago, they there were some islands in the middle of the South China Sea. They're really just rock piles. And the Chinese said, including some that they claimed and some that the Philippines claimed and some that the other countries claimed, the Chinese said, well, we're just going to reinforce these and we're going to make ports out of them because, you know, we have fishing, fishing vessels in the region. And if the fishing vessels get in trouble, we need to have some place for them to go. So they said, but we'll never militarize them. We have no intention of making this a military naval base. And so everybody said, okay, fine, sure. And so the Chinese did. They built up those islands in the South and East China Sea. And yet, sure enough, they militarized them. They are now, they are now where the, Navy, the Chinese Navy goes. And sure enough, the Chinese have started saying, well, you know, if you're coming into the South China Sea, you really can't. American ship, battleships, you have to come in under our terms. American flight, um, military aircraft, you got to come into our, you have to identify yourself. We have to decide if you can come in. So their military threat is one of sort of creeping along to say, this is the most dominant trade route, maritime trade route in the world, and we're going to control it, and we're going to push America out. We're not going to go to war. We're not going to have the battleships blazing at each other. We're just going to incrementally change and do this. I think the other thing that the Chinese have learned, and they saw it during the first Gulf War, and they also saw it when Reagan really defeated the Soviet Union, um, not militarily. We didn't go to war, but we defeated them economically and with our technological innovation. The Chinese learned from that, and they realized, well, you know, we can never go to war with the United States. The United States would beat us. What can we do to challenge the United States and to supplant the United States without actually having to go to war? Because, you know, nuclear war, war, nobody wins. We want to win. And so I think the Chinese have understood that if they can claim the South China Sea militarily, the United States is not going to go to war with them over a bunch of little rock piles in the South China Sea. They've determined that. The second thing they've determined is if they can become the innovative capital of the world, they, they're not good at it themselves, but if they can borrow it, buy it, beg it, steal it from the United States, that they will have 
a dominant technology, um, cyber technology most particularly, but all the component parts of the military. So I look at the military threat that China faces, and I'm not as worried about World War III nuclear war breaking out as I am about the Chinese using another kind of warfare that would be even more effective, which would be cyber war, which would be economic war, which would be um, a war using the technologies of the future. So yes, they are, they are the main threat, but I don't think they're the threat that we've always thought in the traditional sense of a military threat. It's, it's 10 times worse than that. Hmm. Okay, got it. Intellectual property. There's another area where China has been able to gain such an incredible foothold by their actions. Do you think, could you put a value on the intellectual property that China has literally stolen from corporations, other nations? I mean, it just seems to be almost incalculable, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's in the trillions because they've been doing it for 20 years. And it's not just intellectual property. It, it, it's just the whole way they've conducted themselves economically. You know, it, um, in the United States, I think a lot of experts, Republicans, Democrats, foreign policy experts, looked at China in 1980, 90, 2000. And they said, well, you know, if we help China, if we help China bring it into the modern world, we'll help them develop economically. It'll be a great market for our goods. And once the Chinese develop a middle class, they'll do what all the other countries have done. They will become a more open society and, and good, fair trading partners with the United States. And that was not a bad assumption because that's what happened in World War, after World War II, Germany, our adversary in World War II, we helped them with the Marshall Plan. They became a strong, vibrant economy and trading partners with us. The same thing happened with Japan. The same thing happened with Korea. So we assumed that China would take the same route. China has gone in a very different direction, though. Since 2000, when they joined the World Trade Organization, they have exploited um, the advantages that they were given as a developing nation, advantages that we gave them, really often at the expense of our own industrial development. And American companies, um, Chinese companies, took over the products that American companies were making. And so they practiced this sort of exploitation. And we were so preoccupied with the Middle East that we kind of took our hand, you know, we took our eye off the ball. And so I think that when you think about what's the trade, the, the threat that China faces, and, and particularly um, the economic and all that, th that's where they're headed. That, that's the direction mm -hmm. they're going in. Okay, last China question, and then just a couple more before we run out of time. What can the average American do uh, to help the United States win this economic war, this war of on many fronts with China is simply buy American, uh, don't travel to China, or uh, what would you suggest somebody listening in right now who's not a Washingtonian, who's not an assistant secretary, what might the average American do to help us on, with this threat? I think it sounds so simple, but vote, participate. Now, what are the Chinese and the, and the Russians trying to do right now, today? They're trying to undermine our confidence in democracy. The Chinese are going around the world right now, and they're saying, look, America's dysfunctional. They can't even, they can't agree on anything. They can't even agree on whether wear the damn face mask or not. And they're saying, we're the better model. America was great. Democracy was great. Free market capitalism was terrific in the 20th century. But this is the 21st century. And it's going to be the Chinese century. And we're better at governing ourselves. We're a more efficient country. And don't worry about democracy or your rights. We'll take care of those things for you. We'll give you a peaceful, prosperous future. And so what, where is America in all of this? Well, I think we, you know, if you go vote, participate. Because the American people, we don't like the junk that's going on in Washington now where they're all fighting like, you know, fifth graders on the playground and they're all trying to punch each other in the eye. We, the American people don't like that. So vote for a candidate who isn't gonna be like that. Vote for somebody who's gonna protect your interests and participate because the best way we show the rest of the world that America still has this mojo is by showing that democracy works. Now China is gonna love nothing more than for us to in November fight with each other over who won which seat and who got this electoral voter you know, or who won this county. 
That's what they're hoping for. That's what the Russians want too, but the Chinese will be better at it, is that they want us to fail, not because they're coming after us, they want us to collapse from within. So if you really want to keep America a strong nation, figure out how you can elect leaders who are gonna work with each other. And if they're not, kick them out and get some new leaders. But the United yeah. States needs to have a strong, a functional democracy, because here's what we need to do when we have a functional democracy. We need to, number one, we need to bring the supply chains home. We've seen with this pandemic what the Chinese are trying to do. You don't want, I mean, the Chinese came to us after the pandemic started and they said, you know, we control the amoxicillin, penicillin and acetaminophen, Tylenol. Um, and if, if you start criticizing us for this Chinese you know, coronavirus, we're gonna cut those off. You're not gonna have that in America. So bring those supply chains home. Don't let them have that leverage. The second thing is to go to our like-minded democracies in Europe, um, with particularly with Britain, but with Japan and Korea and say together, we're, we're, we're allies, we're free market democracies, we believe in, in that man can govern himself and that we should have certain freedoms. And together we stand up to China and we say, you're not gonna get away with this. You're trying to screw everybody, but we're not gonna let you get away with it. And then I think the third thing is that every American can do is make sure that your kids and your grandchildren don't study French literature, study the sciences. We're the innovation society. We're the most innovative people and entrepreneurial people in the history of the world, but we've gotten lazy. And so we need to sort of get tough enough again and really maintain our technological lead. That's how Reagan won the Cold War. It was economic and technological. And that's how we stand up to any adversary we have, economic, but really technological. And to show the world democracy works, it is functional, not this dysfunctional group of fifth graders on the playground. Yeah, wow, well, well put, KT. Thank you for that. Last question. You know, in the last couple of chapters in your book, I, I don't remember their precise titles, but basically, you know, you're an optimistic American. I mean, you, you're, you're like Reagan. You know, you, you see brighter days ahead for the nation as long as we do some of the things that you just uh, spoke of. And, you know, there's also some chapters in your book about the absolute misery that you were put through vis-a-vis -vis the Michael Flynn case and the FBI and all of the investigations and the rest of that. I have to say, I mean, it's, it's really um, a pleasant surprise and terrific to see uh, you still have this optimism for America after the United States government just dragged you across the broken glass. You know? and I, so to, how have you maintained that sense of, of optimism for our future when you've, at, you know, at the a critical point in your career, became the target of, of the United States government? I think I should probably preface this by saying that um, when they, you know, Mueller investigation and, and the things that happened and the Russia, the Russia investigation, which we now know is the Russia hoax, um, that being caught in, up in the middle of it and really being pressured, I think, by the FBI and the Mueller people to plead guilty to crimes I didn't commit or to claim others committed crimes, which I didn't think they committed. And now that's all come out. You know, now we've seen, and I think we will see more of, the fact that it was the abuse of power by a certain group of people at the you know, top of the intelligence community and the, and the Department of Justice. But when it was all over, when, I, when it's clear that General Flynn had pled guilty and that he was going his own course, I refused to do what Flynn did. Um, and finally the FBI and the Mueller people gave up on me and my wonderful husband. Um, there was a point at which I was really, I, I really was ready to throw in the towel where I'd been so badgered and they subpoenaed me yet again. And I turned to my lawyer and I said, what could they possibly want? I've met with them for 30 or 40 hours. There's nothing more I can tell any of these people that I haven't already said. And my lawyer said, well, you know, they've got a narrative and that is the collusion, the Russians, Trump, Flynn, and you're not supporting that narrative and they're just gonna keep coming after you. And so I turned to my wonderful husband and I said, you know, what do they want me to say? I'll just say it. Let's just be done with this. And he says, you can't do that. You know, you can't lie. You can't claim people did crimes just to get yourself off. You just got to stick with it and go with it. But when it was finally over for me or mostly over, 
we left the country. My husband and I got on a flight that night. We went to the westernmost part of Scotland and even to the Hebridean Islands where there was no Wi-Fi, no phone, no, you know, no TV, no nothing. And I just tried to put it all together, get my feet back under myself. And what had happened to me? What was going on in my country? And I came to the conclusion, um, which is that, you know, I was collateral damage. I get that. But the United States goes through this. And this is the revolution. This is the Reagan revolution. This is the Trump revolution. This was the Andrew Jackson revolution. And there are, there are casualties. It was just my bad luck to be a casualty of it. But that it is, in fact, the essence of what is great about America. You know, everybody says, oh, I believe in American exceptionalism. And they, they talk about immigration and they talk about innovation and all the other things that we can, all, we can all tick off. And they're all terrific. They all make America a great nation. But the one that makes us exceptional is that ability to reinvent ourselves. I mean, we invent ourselves, reinvent ourselves as individuals. You know, some of the most successful people in America, they're self-made. They created new industries that they did the impossible and they did it themselves. But as a nation, we also reinvent ourselves. That's what we've always done. We're good at it and we were expected to do it. The founding fathers understood that for America to be great and remain great, we would have to reinvent ourselves. And that's what we're in the process of doing now. So do I like being collateral damage? No. Do I wish things had turned out differently? You bet. But am I happy and, and optimistic for my children and grandchildren's generation? You bet I am. Because there's, as Reagan said, probably better than anybody, you know, freedom is something that every generation has to win again. And if you don't, if you don't fight the fight, if you don't stand up for what you believe in, then soon enough, we'll all just be sitting around the campfire talking about what a great country America used to be. So yeah, I am optimistic about the future. Yeah, well, a great, great credit to you, uh, KT, for uh, feeling that way and uh, and writing such a terrific book. And uh, we, uh, while you may not be wearing a military uniform, thank you for your service to this country for so many years. And it's just been a pleasure to to have you with us today. And you get the rain check. I am definitely coming in person. <laughs> that minute we're allowed to do this again. <laughs> thank you yeah, for the well, opportunity. You're absolutely invited. It's been yeah, a pleasure thanks, and it's Katie. been a real honor. Thank you. Okay, take care. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual programming event. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.